everyone. Sorry to be a couple minutes late. Let's get set up here. I do not have any comments from the top, so Matt, do you want to kick us off today? Sure. Um, yeah. So um, have the Israelis told you what they plan to do in response to um, what happened over the weekend? Uh, they have not. We have been in close communication with them uh, as well as other partners in the region over the past few days. The Secretary has continued his consultations. Uh, in the past 24 hours, he has um, uh, talked to Benny Gantz, he, the, uh, a minister in, in the Israeli War Cabinet. Uh, he has uh, just in the past couple of hours completed a phone call with the Prime Minister and Foreign Minister uh, of Qatar, uh, Minister Al Tani, and he continues to send the same messages in all of his conversations, which is we do not want to see further escalation of the conflict. Uh, okay. And have you gotten any, uh, <coughs> any response that leads you to believe that the Israelis will heed your advice? I think I will let the Israelis speak for themselves about what decisions they will make. Obviously, these are their sovereign decisions, um, but we have been clear that we are committed to Israel's defense, but we do want to see, as you've heard multiple members of the administration say, uh, uh, no escalation of this conflict. All right, and then you just said you spoke to Gantz <coughs> and the Prime Minister of Qatar, but uh, do you have other Qatar. call? Yeah, uh, he has continued to make calls. I don't have any other calls to read out or announce at this point. Does he plan to speak to Netanyahu, or does he plan to speak to, to Gallant, or? Uh, I don't have any other calls to announce. He typically doesn't speak by with Prime Minister Netanyahu by phone. As you know, the President usually handles those phone conversations, and he just talks to the Prime Minister when we're in Israel uh, on trips. Can you say, at, at the current moment, <coughs> where we are right now, um, uh, do you are your concerns still as high as they may have been over the weekend for escalation? They continue to be high. It's always tough to, to um, assign an exact percentage or say if they've gone up or, or gone down, partially because we have been at uh, risk of escalation of this conflict really since October 7th, and it's been something that we have wor been working to avoid and something that we have been working to contain. And there have been various periods where the risk of escalation has gone up, obviously, uh, over the weekend, we saw the risk of escalation uh, uh, increase dramatically. And of course, the Iranians did escalate the conflict. Um, this was clearly an escalatory act, the launching of 300 missiles and drones from Iranian soil directly targeted at the state of Israel. And so what we're going to continue to do is try to de-escalate the, the conflict. Um, uh, but I, as long as the war in Gaza continues, we're not going to be back at the place we were before October 7th. It is an ongoing process of trying to keep um, uh, tensions in the region, uh, to reduce tensions in the region and try to maintain as much calm as possible, knowing that there is an ongoing conflict that obviously exacerbates tensions uh, in Israel and around the region. Okay. Last one. I just want to uh, know if um, – has any of these developments affected the Secretary's travel plans? No. Uh, he still intends to leave tonight for the G7 uh, foreign ministers meeting in Capri and uh, Italy and be there tomorrow, Thursday and Friday. sense of what their plans are, but did they give you any timeline of when they might respond, hours, days? Uh, I'm just not going to speak uh, to those private conversations. And as I said, those are really um, decisions for the Israeli government and, and questions best posed to the Israeli government. Has there been any exchange of messages between the U.S. and Iran in the wake of this weekend's? Uh, there has not been, and I've seen some false reporting about messages exchanged between the United States and Iran, the reports claiming that we have delivered messages to them. Uh, there have not been such messages delivered. It's been days since we've communicated, since we've sent, sent messages to the, the government of Iran. And I, I say that as a reminder of something we've said before. Oftentimes, the Iranian government has misled the world about either messages they've passed to us or messages that uh, we have passed to them, and some of those reports over the past few days have been false. Do you have any plans to engage with the Iranian foreign minister when he's in New York? Uh, I do not anticipate any such engagements. Can you confirm the U.S. has granted him a visa for his visit to so, Iran? So a few things about that. Number one, visa records are confidential as a matter of law. They're not something I can speak to from this podium. Number two, we do take our obligation as the host nation uh, of the United Nations quite seriously, um, and that includes allowing diplomats from other countries, even countries with whom we have um, uh, significant disagreements to attend UN meetings and UN functions. But number three, we do have the ability to restrict and in fact severely restrict the movements of certain diplomats um, 
while they are in New York for legitimate UN meetings. So should the foreign minister of Iran attend this meeting at the United Nations, I would not expect to see him uh, admit very many locations outside the United Nations. Are there already restrictions? So this is a further restriction? Uh, I, again, I'm not going to speak to that uh, in detail other than to say we do have the ability to impose very severe restrictions uh, on the movements of certain diplomats. and. Um, I would not expect to see him very many places outs outside the United Nations. Because one of the first things you guys did, like in February, just after you came into office, was to remove the restrictions that were put on Iranian diplomats uh, in New York. So have you restored those? So as I stand here today, and, and those, hold on. those restrictions, if I'm correct, and I think I am, it precluded them from going anywhere outside of the UN building, the Iranian mission, and like a five block radius of the east side. So as I stand here today, a day before the scheduled meeting when he is not here, the Iranian foreign minister is not here in the, uh, New York, uh, I'm not able to speak to that question or answer it in detail. Um, uh, but I will just say, should he attend, you can expect very severe restrictions well, on his on his well, movements well, inside New York. The foreign missions puts out it, it did when when the Trump administration did this, it, it, you know, it was public. It, it came out. So. Uh, so I would just I would just say, and, I, and you guys rescinded them and, very deliberately. And I would say, stay tuned. Uh, but I would not expect to see him, for example, snapping selfies. Uh, on top of the Empire State Building, should he attend, should he travel to New York to attend this meeting? Well, how about snapping selfies on the East River at the at the at the UN building? Uh, uh, obviously, I, th that goes back to the thing I said at the beginning, which is um, so we, do take, our, we, do, we, do, we do take our we do we do we do we do we do we do take our obligation as the host of the United Nations seriously, uh, but we have the ability to impose restrictions for people to travel outside of attending. United Nations meetings and say hotels and airports and such things, the ability to travel to and from United Nations meetings. Mr. Ryan, uh, go ahead. Uh, just to follow up, and you, you mentioned it's been days since you've sent any messages. What, so are you talking about, sorry, messages to the government of Iran? You're talking about the indirect messages that are sent through through other countries, right? Correct. Uh, and, the, and when you say days, do you mean this is before the attacks on the weekend, the last time that that happened? Uh, I am not going to get into the detail. I'm going to try to go back to what has been our usual posture. As you recall, usually we, what we have done is not publicly discuss those messages. There have been a few times in the past week where we have communicated about these messages because we've seen the Iranian uh, government mislead the world about what we have said or what they have said to us. So I wanted to, to make public the fact that we did have not sent a message in the last few days because I have seen this reporting about messages that we supposedly sent to them in the past few days that has been is completely false uh, and is not true. But I'm going to get back to our usual posture of keeping those communications private. Okay, just before, before that begins, is there, <laughs> are, there any, are there any messages received since since the, the attack? Uh, I, I don't have any further messages to read out. And is there a U.S. assessment? Uh, whether if in the event of an Israeli response, uh, you know, if it, as expected, the Israelis, or as, you know, as, as might be expected, the Israelis strike in Iran itself, does the U.S. have an assessment of how Iran would react to that, and is that part of these discussions that, that are taking place? I think that gets me into a double hypothetical, and I'm going to decline even to, do, to, to engage with the first part of that hypothetical question, let, let alone the second. Um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Um, the IDF. What's that? Specifics of this double hypothetical. <laughs> <laughs> um, Keep it to one next time. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, the IDF confirmed that they've uh, uh, eliminated a uh, senior Hezbollah commander um, who uh, was part of their coastal operations. Um, should we read that as any in any way uh, of retaliation or the beginning of something to do with Iran? Um, and then I have a, another question on the IDF. So I'm reluctant to tell you how to, to read it or to, to um, try and provide any guidance about how to read it. I would note, of course, that Israel has been engaged in conflict and exchange of fire with Hezbollah uh, back, well, obviously before October 7th, but in a significant way since October 7th. That's not, that's, that in itself is not an unusual activity uh, to have occurred. Thank you. And um, do you have uh, any um, updates since yesterday on um, uh, conversations with the Israelis about uh, Rafa, their Rafa operation, any 
um, anything from them about a humanitarian plan uh, on Russia. Um, and do you also have an update on the number of Americans who may be still, American citizens who may still be in Gaza who want to leave Gaza, including their non-American family members? Uh, so with respect to the second question, that's a good one. It's been a no, it's been some time since I've checked. I will take that back and, and uh, get you an answer. I'm not sure if we have a, an assessment. The, you know, for, for a while we were working to facilitate the departure of American citizens and family members, and we still are. But the demand that we have seen from American citizens and their family members has declined dramatically over time, as you would expect, right? A lot of people leave um, uh, at the outset of the conflict, and then others make decisions to stay for various reasons. So the demand has gone down significantly over time. But I'll check and see if we have an assessment of the number remaining. And then in, in, in terms of a, a, a RAFA operation, um, I don't have any, uh, we have not yet had the follow-on meeting to talk in detail about the government of Israel's plans. And we have still not been briefed in detail on their plans, either for a humanitarian uh, evacuation or humanitarian considerations or on the military side. Let me go here. I'll come to you. I'll come to you next, Dan. Go ahead. Uh, Lyle, I want to go to about the uh, Shifa hospital. Today, a UN team entered, and they, what they are saying is, what they are witnessing is horrific scenes. Yesterday, a mass grave has been discovered in the outskirts of a Shifa hospital that contains so many unknown bodies. Do you see these reports, and do you have any comments on it? I've seen the report. I don't have any independent assessment to offer uh, at this time. I'd want to look into, um, I'd want to look into it in detail before I can offer any kind of reaction. But did you reach out to the Israelis? Did you, are you opening an investigation on that? It's a mass grave. So again, we don't have American personnel in Israel who can, open such an investigation or conduct any kind of inquiry. We don't have people on the ground who can look into it, what happened. These are the types of things we raise with the Israeli government uh, regularly. With respect to this specific one, I have just seen the report. So uh, before I offer any kind of detailed comment on it, I want to be able to look into it and confer with my colleagues about what any follow-up steps might be. Uh, my last question will be any updates on how many trucks are entering Gaza now daily? Are, are they still at the 400 level? We have seen a significant increase in the, the number of trucks. They've gotten up to 400. Some days they've dipped back be, uh, below. For example, late last week there were a few days uh, during Eid when it was hard to find truck drivers. So tr the, the level of deliveries dipped. We have seen, however, a steady increase in the number of trucks that are going into, um, uh, into Gaza. I, I would say it is not just the number of trucks, however, that we focused on. It's also where the trucks are going, um, ensuring that they get into northern Gaza. As you heard me say yesterday, um, uh, on Sunday, 65 trucks had gone into northern Gaza, and there were more planned for yesterday. I believe those trucks did move into northern Gaza. It's been ensuring that um, uh, Ashdod port is open. It now is open for humanitarian uh, deliveries. It's ensuring that bakeries, including bakeries in northern Gaza, can reopen. In the past 24 hours, we have seen bakeries reopen, which is important um, uh, for getting food directly to the, the Palestinian people. And so with all of these mechanisms, we are, have been working uh, to increase their capacity and make sure they are sustained. And we have seen improvement not yet to the level where it needs to be, and certainly it, once it gets to that level, we need to see it sustained over time, and that's how we're gonna judge things, but we have seen some steady improvement over the past 10 days or so. Yeah, go ahead. I said I'd come to Jenny next, but go ahead. Um, Both Paul, and then I'll come to you, Jan. On trucks uh, going into Gaza, uh, is, the, is these numbers, are these numbers based on Israeli figures? Uh, this is my first question. And secondly, Anwar released a report today saying that there has been no significant change in the volume of humanitarian supplies entering Gaza uh, or the improved access to the north. Uh, since the beginning of April, they said an average of 881 eight trucks have crossed into Gaza per day. Uh, what is your assessment on this? I mean, it, it seems that, you know, maybe Israel has taken some steps in this regard, but it seems it's not enough. It, do you agree? And also, uh, we'll follow up on that. Sure. So first of all, with respect to this dispute over trucks, part of it is counting different things, uh, and, and not just counting a different way, but there are some uh, deliveries that happen that are commercial deliveries that the UN doesn't count because they're not part of the relief efforts that the UN monitors. So two things happen. Number one, um, there are trucks that come in uh, through Rafah and through Karim Shalom 
that then are offloaded at Rafa and Karim Shalom and loaded onto UN trucks, and UN diff uses different size trucks, so the UN counts their trucks, not the number of trucks that are coming in. It is a different, uh, a different way to actually measure the number of trucks. However, even that said, the UN number itself doesn't capture the entire daily volume because there are commercial trucks that are coming in, in some cases coming in directly through the north, through Ares, or um, are coming in through um, uh, the 96 gate crossing that they open, or are coming in through the south and driving up the, and are driving up internal roads, and those aren't counted, to my understanding, in the UN numbers because they're not being delivered through any of the UN agencies, through UNRWA, um, or through the World, World Food Program or others. So st the UN number does not count the total amount of, of delivery that goes in. Um, that said, I would agree with the overall assessment that we are not yet at the level we need to be. Very much agree with that. Um, but we have seen steady progress and there are other things that are coming online. For example, this thing you've heard me talk about before where there um, are, are trucks now that are making deliveries directly from Jordan uh, coming through Israel and then delivering directly into Gaza. That is happening. It's going to be increased as Israel makes certain improvements to traffic and clearing rubble and other debris that's blocking other uh, uh, the ability to sustain further traffic through some of these crossings that have recently opened. So we've gone up. We see the pathway to going up more. We want to ensure that that's what actually happens and that's what we're working every day to do. So that's a long-winded answer, I know, but it's a complicated question. Some reports say that you know quantity changed in increased, quantity of trucks changed, increased, but trucks are not fully loaded. Is this something that you also observe uh, and or raise with Israelis? I'm sure it's I'm sure it is the case that some trucks are not fully loaded. I have a hard time kind of litigating this exact dispute where you know you lo I'm uh, uh, looking at every truck that goes in. But our, I will say, our humanitarian experts who are on the ground have seen an increased volume, not just of trucks, but of humanitarian assistance going in. We have seen that over the past 10 days. Um, but that said, it's not enough, and it needs to continue, and it needs to be sustained. And that's what, that is uh, absolutely what we are working on every day. Jan, go ahead. Thank you. Two questions on Israel and Iran. It was reported that the Director General of IAEA said there were concerns that Israel would attack Iranian nuclear facilities. What is your opinion on this possibility? Uh, again, I'm not going to uh, engage with hypotheticals at all other than to say that we want to continue to avoid further escalation in the region. Yeah, before we leave this, have you guys decided yet or made a determination about whether what Israel hit in Damascus was a diplomatic we, facility we, or not? We have not. We have not. So how long is this going to take? I can't answer that question. We're look, continuing to look into it. Um, I don't have a timetable, but it's something that we're... Uh, we need to, to gather enough information that will allow us to make an actual determination. You have no one on the ground in Syria. We have a range, as I said to you when uh, the last time you engaged with me on this question, we have an, uh, a range of abilities, a range of ways to gather information. They're partner countries of ours who are on the ground. We have intelligence capabilities, off, uh, obviously, um, and we're continuing to gather information, but we've not yet been able to yeah. make a determination. I, 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 I get it, but you were pretty quick into you know condemning the uh, you know the invasion of the Mexican embassy in uh, in, in in Ecuador. That right. was a very clear, well-established embassy. Uh, th 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 this is something that is taking a little bit more time to, to determine. Uh, that's not the question. The question was, what is it? Is it was it an embassy or a consulate or not? And it was very clear. How in, in the, it was very clear in the case of the Mexican. It's something that we're gathering information on. Uh, and we continue yeah. to gather information. We don't have a determination yet. Certainly. Uh, what are the United States concerns about Iran working with North Korea to pursue nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles? Certainly, that's something we'd be incredibly concerned about. Uh, stay in the region? Yeah. Where, who said yes? Back there. Go ahead. I heard a yes. I couldn't see it. Go ahead. Going into uh, Gaza, are you talking to Israel about the contents of these trucks? Medical supplies are in um, Gaza is a major need of medical supplies, and some people on the ground are saying, "Yes, we're getting food, canned food, but we're not getting medical supplies." And one question about the West Bank: two Palestinians were killed in Israeli 
uh, settlers attack on the some villages on the West Bank. Are you pressuring the Israeli government in regards to that, especially in light of Ben Gvir's um, open um, arming of settlers? So two things. First of all, um, with respect to your first question, um, we have been engaged with the Israeli government, and not just with the Israeli government, but with our partner countries in the region as well as the various United Nations uh, agencies about the importance of getting medical supplies into Gaza. They are very much needed. Um, and there have been medical supplies going in, there, uh, but not nearly enough. And it's been something that we've been incredibly focused on. We've also been working with um, uh, those partners to, to talk to the government of Israel to make sure that items that are legitimate medical items aren't excluded from deliveries. Uh, into Gaza, and that's something we'll, con we'll continue to do. And with respect to the West Bank, we do remain incredibly concerned about uh, the increase in violence in the West Bank. I put out a statement on that yesterday. We've seen uh, tensions continue since then. We have made absolutely clear that the government of Israel has a responsibility to police extremist settler violence. It has the responsibility to hold extremist settlers responsible when they commit acts of violence. And as we have done in the past, if we don't see sufficient action, we are prepared to take actions of our own. But do you expect it to go out of hand? Uh, I'm not going to make any predictions about what will happen in the future. We're incredibly concerned. One of the things that we have impressed upon Israel since October 7th is the importance of maintaining calm in the West Bank and that failing to properly hold settlers account accountable for their violence risks an escalation that isn't just harmful to the Palestinian people in, that live in the West Bank, but it's harmful to Israel's ultimate con security and that it risks broader regional de-escalation. And so we've made the case of why it's in Israel's interest to take this matter incredibly seriously uh, and to hold people accountable for violent attacks, and we'll continue to do that. Michelle. Israel to alert the U.S. when they decide to retaliate? Uh, I'm just not going to deal with um, uh, uh, that hypothetical question. We are engaged with them closely um, about the need to avoid escalation in the region, but I'll keep those conversations quiet or uh, co confidential. Well, I think um, the last question I'm going to ask about the government's finding was on the World Central Kitchen envoy strike. The U.S., you said, was reviewing it at the time. Has there been any assessment made on that? Uh, there hasn't been a final assessment. It, we are continuing to review the results of their investigation, and we're also continuing to engage not with the government of Israel about this question, but with humanitarian organizations to see what questions they have, um, and um, that process is ongoing. And you're not calling for a separate independent investigation? We are not at this time. We're continuing to review those results and engage with uh, humanitarian partners. When do you expect this review process uh, to wrap I don't up? have a timetable. Go ahead. emphasize its unwilling to escalate uh, it, the region and at the same time uh, you support uh, United States support Israel which occupied the Palestinian territories and in the same in the uh, it's which is the main and direct cause of the escalation and in instability in the region why don't you why you ignore this reason and you work in different direction I'm sorry I think I missed I missed why do we ignore what, what? Why United States ignore this reason that the uh, occupation is the, the main reason and direct reason for the uh, escalation and the violence in the area? So first of all, I would say that um, it has long been our policy to see the establishment of an independent Palestinian state. That predates October 7th. Um, but the pursuit of that policy has been something we have been engaged in vigorously since October 7th. You've seen the Secretary travel to the region to engage with Arab partners uh, about putting on the table a real plan for normalization between Israel and its neighbors that would include a pathway to an independent Palestinian state would establish real security for Israel. That said, and I think it's always important to emphasize this um, when this question comes up as it has before, Nothing that happened before October 7th justified the attacks of October 7th. Um, and I think it's always uh, important just to make that clear. Uh, yeah, one more. Uh, I wonder if you heard about what happened today in Maghazi camp in Gaza, uh, the massacre, what happened. And today, more, uh, the most who killed them are children and women today, this morning in Gaza. I, I, I have not uh, yet seen that report. I'm happy to, to look into it. Alex, go ahead. Sure, go ahead. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, let me start with a uh, question on uh, the report that you guys have submitted to the Congress yesterday uh, on compliance report on uh, arms agreement. 
uh, there's a line there saying that the United States continues to provide Russia with free launch notifications of ICBM and SLBM launches and notifications of heavy bomber exercises uh, in accordance with proper agreement, obviously, which remain uh, separate from the new stuff. Um, is this a two-way road? And when last time this exchange was actually in so the Alex, I mean? Alex, I'm going to make an admission here, which I have not read that report or am fully tracking the details. I'm happy to take that back and uh, look into the report's language and get back to you on it. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to move to Georgia, if I may. Uh, I want to follow up on your previous comment. You were particularly directed to the Georgian Dream government who were discouraging them from moving forward, but they did act anyway. Uh, but there are protesters out there for the second day in a row uh, to trying to save the democracy. What is your message to the protesters? Do they have your sympathy? I, I, I realize I'm you know, asking for bare minimum. Uh, so I want to say, first of all, with respect to that draft legislation, it does still remain draft legislation. And the past, last time um, this draft legislation was proposed, we saw it take several steps forward, but ultimately not pass into law. And so I don't think you, um, we're at any point where we can make any predictions. Uh, yet about what's going to happen, uh, uh, going to ha going to happen. But I will just reiterate that we do re remain deeply concerned about that law. And with respect to uh, protesters in Georgia or anywhere else in the world, uh, of course, the United States uh, supports everyone's right everywhere in the world to freedom of expression and freedom of speech. It's not, it's not the first time the initiators, same folks, are initiating this, you know, uh, Russian law. And uh, what is your reaction to those who believe that? Those initiators are acting uh, in, in impunity. While you are waiting for other shoes to drop, they are already taking the action that you can reverse if you act later. Uh, so, Alex, I would say, as I, I would just refer you to the comments I made one moment ago, which is we have seen this legislation proposed before and not make it into law. It is still currently draft legislation. We've made very clear that we are concerned about it. And as, opposed, as, um, as it pertains to any possible steps, I'm not going to preview anything here. But I would say that is always the case, where we do not preview potential sanctions or other measures that we might impose uh, before we do so. And the final one, and I want to go uh, out back up of yesterday. I'm sure you have seen President Zelensky's comments yesterday, in which he made it clear that we can now see how unity can work truly 100%, and, and how almost 100% of Shahids and missiles can be intercepted. Um, you know, frankly, Ukrainian officials don't really understand why is it that the United States is not helping them directly to prevent uh, Russian attacks, at least you know, in, uh, in targeting their energy infrastructure? So a few things. Number one, um, I saw the comments from the president very much understand where he's coming from. I would expect the president of any country who is under such withering attacks to um, look for any way possible to defend his people. Um, fully understand that. Um, number two, I, I think it is important to note the context that we have an entirely different relationship with Ukraine and Israel in that our relationship with Israel goes back decades and in terms of a security partnership. We have had a decades-long security partnership with Israel where we have been providing them direct military aid, not just going back two years of a conflict, but for decades, and have had long, broad-standing communications between our military and the Israeli military um, that, pr that goes back decades. Um, Israel is a major non-NATO ally of the United States. Ukraine is just in a different position in that we did not have that kind of agreement with them prior to the immediate months out, uh, before this conflict. But what you have seen us do since this conflict is um, provide them with the m equipment they need to defend themselves. And that includes, of course, air defense systems, Patriot systems and other air defense systems that we have either provided the Ukrainian military ourselves or we have sourced from other partner and ally countries around the world so they can defend themselves. And much of the reason that they have been able to successfully defend themselves against barrage after barrage after barrage of Russian attacks is because of those air defense systems that we have provided. Now, that said, you're right that we are not in armed military conflict with Russia, which is what it would require for US planes to be in the skies over Ukraine engaging with Russian attacks. And we are, are not gonna be in direct armed conflict with Russia. The President of the United States has, been ma has made that very clear. I think it's in the interest of the American people that we not be in direct armed conflict between the United States and Russia because we do not want World War III. That said, we are entirely committed to the defense of Ukraine we have proved that over the past two years. The president has proved that um, by providing American support. And if you want to ask the question about what more we can do, 
The question is one to put to the United States Congress because we have a supplemental spending bill that would allow us to provide more equipment, including more air defense systems to Ukraine that they very much need, and we hope that bill will pass. Okay. Go. Um, on sanctions, do you have any update on reimposing Venezuela sanctions the deadline for a decision? I believe it was Thursday. Uh, it is Thursday. Is that, uh, it's uh, two days from now, the 18th. I, in my mind, I had it as tomorrow, but you're right, it is on Thursday. So um, we have made very clear, you saw when we allowed one of the licenses that we had given them with respect to the gold industry to expire in, I believe it was February, we made clear that there was another license th uh, on their oil industry that was set to expire on April 18th. We are two days from April 18th. We have, been ma we have made very clear that if Maduro and his representatives did not fully implement their, ag their agreements under the Barbados Agreement, we would um, reimpose sanctions, and I would just say stay tuned. Moving towards free and fair elections, which was part of that Barbados agreement. Um, we uh, he has upheld certain aspects of the Barbados agreement, including setting an election timetable and inviting international observation missions. At the same time, you've seen him uh, block candidates from the opposition from the ballot. So those are things that we take very seriously, and I don't want to make any announcements ahead of their time. But you should certainly stay tuned uh, over the next few days to see what more we will have to say uh, in advance of this deadline. Is there any concern that reimposing these sanctions could have some sort of impact or exacerbate irregular migration from that country? Uh, so ir uh, irregular migration is something we continue to work to uh, to work on uh, with our partners in the region, um, but I don't want to answer that question in detail because it sort of presumes a policy choice that I'm not ready to announce it at, at this time. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Last week there was a meeting in, in Mexico between U.S. officials and, and Venezuelan officials. Do you have any details of what was discussed there? Or uh, I'm not going to comment on private diplomatic exchanges. Venezuela to the government. I was, I was just saying, well, I was just saying but, but we have made very clear directly to uh, Maduro and his representatives that we expect them to uphold the things they agreed to under the Barbados Agreement. Another meeting today here in Washington with Cuban authorities on, on migration. Do you have any, any um, comments on what is being discussed and, and what is this meeting for? So uh, these were bilateral discussions between the United States and Cuba. They are um, uh, bilateral discussions on migration that take place biannually, twice a year. Um, they reflect the commitment by the United States to regularly review the implementation of the U.S.-Cuba Migration Accords, which dates back to 1984. Uh, ensuring safe, orderly, humane, and regular migration between Cuba and the United States remains a primary interest of the United States, consistent with our interest in fostering family reunification and promoting greater respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms in Cuba. Uh, go ahead. Uh, so what are some of the diplomatic measures uh, that the U.S. is doing uh, to de-escalate tensions since the Iran attack? Uh, so we are engaging in, uh, so uh, first of all, I, I, I want to say two things about that. One we are engaging in diplomacy to make clear that we don't want to see de-escalation. So that's a message you, the Secretary has delivered in his direct conversations uh, with his counterparts in the region. It's the message that others have delivered um, in their conversations with counterparts in the region, others from, from both our building and, and broader inside the administration. But there is another thing that we are doing, too, when it comes to diplomacy, and that is ensuring a coordinated diplomatic response to the unprecedented escalatory actions that Iran has taken. And you've seen the, the Secretary engage in conversations with his G7 counterparts. The President, of course, held a video call uh, with the leaders of the G7 countries on Sunday, and it's something that we will continue to coordinate on in the days ahead. And then as far as uh, the Arab countries like Jordan, uh, are, is there a strategy to help bolster them uh, since they took action in shooting down those drones? And so I'm going to let uh, uh, I'm going to let any country speak to its own actions. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, report today that six-year-old girl in Gaza City was killed and the paramedics who went to rescue her. Uh, and that report finds that the ammunition matches that of Israel. Does the State Department have a new comment? You've spoken to it before, said you've been in touch with the Israelis. Are you satisfied with their explanation? So I, I did read that report right before I walked out here to the podium. And I, I just want to say again that the death of Hein Rajab uh, is really an unspeakable tragedy something that never should have occurred and never should occur. Um, when this, when she first died and we saw the reports of her death 
we raised the matter with the government of Israel directly. Um, they told us that they had conducted an investigation and found that there, are no, there were no IDF units in the area at the time of her death. I read the Post report, and the Post has concluded something to the contrary. Um, so what we're going to do is take the information that is contained in that Washington Post story. We're going to go back to the government of Israel and ask them for further in information. We would still welcome a full investigation into this matter uh, and how it occurred in the first place. You've said repeatedly that there are processes that the State Department has. I don't know if Kirby's referred to them as well. Is this one of those such processes where the United States has – could you do something independently here? So. We do have processes ongoing to uh, look at various incidents. I have made it a practice never to confirm when a specific incident is under consideration as part of one of these processes, but there are a number of incidents that continue to be under review at the State Department, um, uh, and that will continue to be the case. That is a separate matter than raising the question uh, with the Government of Israel and asking what they have found, and that's what we've done in, in this case, and that's what we'll be going back to them to do with the new details that were raised by the Washington Post. The humanitarian tier uh, that DOD is leading on. Uh, are you facilitating relationships with NGOs to to make that to get that aid into Gaza? We have been in conversation. Obviously, DOD is the lead for the construction of that pier and the operation of that pier. Um, but our special envoy, David Satterfield, as well as peop, uh, officials in our embassy in Jerusalem, have been in, engaged in conversations with the government Israel of Israel and various United Nations agencies and private relief organizations about the operation of that pier and how to ensure that aid that is delivered into Gaza over that pier can then be uh, properly and efficiently distributed inside Gaza, which of course has been one of the difficulties over the past couple of months uh, once aid actually is delivered. That's, that was, that's been true for uh, the delivery of aid over land routes, and what we're working to ensure is that it, that is not a, a problem for the delivery of aid through this new maritime corridor. Um, go ahead. Uh, you've been talking about, uh, with increasing concern about um, Chinese uh, support for uh, Russian military industrial base. Uh, um, so have you warned the Chinese against doing that like you did a while ago when, to, when it comes to um, lethal aid? Or are you planning any actions now to, to address that? And uh, <coughs> separately, if I may. <coughs> Polish President Duda uh, said today that he will meet with um, former President Trump. That's obviously uh, um, uh, another you know, meeting after um, uh, David Cameron met with him and, and the Ukrainians expressed uh, interest in that. Uh, how are you concerned at all about you know, these, these um, meetings? There, there might be some shadow diplomacy or something like that. Uh, I don't have any comment on, on those meetings other than to say that we have seen um, over the course of years of American elections where uh, foreign governments engage with the nominees of major parties here, just as American diplomats and American leaders often engage with um, foreign opposition leaders. The Secretary has regularly engaged with the opposition leader in Israel. He met with the opposition leader um, uh, from uh, the United Kingdom when he was in Munich in February. So that's something that has happened over decades between um, between governments of, of various parties in the United States and, and in other countries. Um, with respect to your first question, remind me. Oh, with, with China. Um, so we have long made clear to uh, the People's Republic of China that we would have concern with any actions that they took to support Russia's war in Ukraine. And that does not include that – doesn't, that doesn't have to just be direct military support, but that we would be incredibly concerned about them – about any steps taken by Chinese companies to reconstitute Russia's defense industrial base. And so what we have seen over the past months is that there have been materials moving from China to Russia that Russia has used to rebuild that reindustrial base. Uh, and produce arms that are showing up on the battlefield in Ukraine. And we are incredibly concerned about that. You saw the Secretary engage with NATO foreign ministers about that week before last. Uh, it will certainly be on the agenda uh, when he uh, travels to the G7 tomorrow. 
um, to meet with G7 partner countries. And then the only thing I will say uh, further about that is the Secretary does plan to travel to China in the coming weeks, and you can certainly, ex uh, without getting too far ahead of those meetings, you can certainly uh, expect that that is an issue that uh, he would be expected to raise. Uh, go ahead. Regarding Venezuela, again, because we have Senior President Gustavo Petro from Colombia, he has been engaging with Maduro, for instance, last week, at the same time that the U.S. officials were meeting with uh, representatives from the Maduro government in Mexico, he was meeting with Maduro in Venezuela. How important has been the role of President Gustavo Petro, and do you believe that he is aligned with the U.S. towards Venezuela and sanctions? Uh, let me take that back and get your comment. All the way in the back. Yeah. Um, can you provide any information on, on the assurances that the U.S. has given the High Court in London on the proposed extradition of Julian Assange? Uh, I would defer to the Department of Justice on that question. Is the U.S. working on a possible plea deal in this case, and is that something that the Australian government has asked for? Uh, when it comes to plea deals or any other matters of ongoing cases, I'm going to defer to my colleagues at the Justice Department who um, should be the ones to, to comment on that. Although I expect what they'll say is you can look to their court filings for any comment, but still, is still what I have. Is that the U.S. has been discussing with the Australian government? Uh, again, I'm just going to defer to the Department of Justice. Go ahead. Uh, Pakistan has initiated discussions with the IMF uh, over a new multi-billion uh, dollars loan agreement. Uh, Pakistani Prime Minister is here and seeking U.S. help in terms of investments. Um, is U.S. supporting or can support Pakistan reach an ending time? So we welcome last month's announcement that the IMF has reached a staff level agreement with Pakistan. We understand, the, uh, as you said, the Pakistani Minister of Finance is in town uh, here in Washington for meetings uh, at the IMF and World Bank. Pakistan has made progress to stabilize its economy and we support its efforts to manage its daunting debt burden. We encourage the government to prioritize and expand economic reforms to address its economic challenges. Our support for the country's economic success is unwavering, and we will continue to engage with Pakistan through technical agreements as well as through our trade and investment ties, all of which are priorities of our bi bilateral relationship. The Indian Prime Minister Modi and his defense minister has said, uh, have said in a campaign speech that the new India will not hesitate to cross borders to kill terrorists. They are kind of confessing to the assassination of Niger in Canada, Sanus murder to high flood in New York, and killings in Pakistan. Is this statement of concern for Biden? Uh, so as I have said before, the United States is not going to get in the, into the middle of this, but we do encourage uh, both India and Pakistan to avoid escalation and find a resolution through dialogue. In the past, the United States has imposed sex sanctions on individuals from foreign countries involved in, in assassination attempts here in the United States. Um, but we don't see similar actions against India. What is the reason of this apparent relaxation? So uh, I am never going to preview um, uh, any sanctions uh, actions, which is not to say that there are any coming. But when you ask me to talk about sanctions, it's something that we don't uh, we don't discuss uh, uh, openly. Go ahead. Thank you, Ambassador. I wanted to ask about Qatar. Uh, it sounds like they have prior ties to Hamas. So does the Biden administration see them as a reliable mediator with Hamas now? So. You have heard the Secretary speak to this on a number of occasions, uh, and you heard the President speak to this after we achieved the humanitarian pause back in November that got more than 100 hostages out. We were able to achieve that in great effect because of the work that Qatar did to help us get those hostages out. Qatar has played an incredibly important role in helping get hostages out already, and they have played an incredibly important role in the back and forth negotiations with Hamas uh, over the past few months to try and reach uh, a further ceasefire deal that would get the remaining hostages out. Um, so uh, I would just say with respect to Qatar, um, they have been a close partner in this process. They continue to be, um, and uh, it is because of their work that we've already seen hostages come home. Do you feel like they've been the most they can do? Uh, they have done an incredible, an incredible amount of work. Yes, they have done everything that they can do to try and get these hostages home. Uh, and we continue to engage with them. This, as I said, the Secretary spoke with the Prime Minister and Foreign Minister of Qatar earlier today to talk about um, uh, the latest iteration of a possible hostage deal. And when it comes to um, the impediment to a hostage agreement, it's not Qatar, it's not Egypt, it's not Israel right now, it is Hamas. It is Hamas that has refused to agree to the deal that is on the table, despite the fact that it would achieve much of the things that they have publicly claimed in repeated statements that they are trying to achieve. Go ahead. I want to uh, follow up on a question I asked yesterday. Today, Reuters 
um, reported that if some Palestinian residents are expressing uh, in the West Bank are expressing uh, concerns uh, that um, certain expressing a lack of trust in the authorities meant to protect them. So my question is. Uh, they're, they're saying that the Palestinian Authority is not protected. Does the Palestinian Authority have not only a right but a, a duty to protect them? And I'm talking about within the areas of their jurisdiction. So uh, I would say, let me just ask this answer this question. It's really the same answer I gave yesterday, is that we want to see the appropriate law enforcement authorities in those areas where they have jurisdiction to act. But ultimately, the question comes back to something I said earlier, which is uh, the Israeli authorities, the IDF, have a responsibility to police settler violence and hold settlers accountable for their violence. And that's what we have been engaged with the government of Israel to encourage. Go ahead. I'm just going to, we got to wrap up, so I'm going to go here and then wrap for the day. You have mentioned uh, uh, restrictions on diplomatic movement regarding the Iranian diplomats. Don't you think so it will let another dead end for at least diplomatic conversation. And uh, please also mention. Uh, well, I, I, I didn't just repeat that last part again. I didn't quite catch it. So don't you think so it will let another dead end for at least diplomatic conversation you have with Iran? And what are the channels of communication you have? What are the level of communication level you have with the Iranian side? Oh. Because uh, they have mentioned several times during the crisis that they did inform the United States before this attack. So um, that is not true. First of all, as I said yesterday, that is not accurate. We do have the ability to send messages to the Iranian government which, when it is in their, when it is in our interest to do so. We have done that in the past. We've done that over the past week, although we, um, although we have not done so in the past few days. And, and, and let me just, and the other thing I'll say, which I said in response to an earlier question, maybe before you walked in, which is that you cannot take at face value what you hear the Iranian government say, either about the messages they have sent to us or the messages that we have sent to them, or about reports you see about these, those messages, because oftentimes um, they are uh, either wildly misleading or completely untrue. I mean, um, apparently it seems like what Israel did, it is unjustified to attack a declared diplomatic mission. Before this Israel attacked many uh, positions in Syria, uh, by claiming that Iranian airlines are involved in the weaponizing the Syrian. Um, but this time, this thing sinks Iran to the, to the direct in engagement with the Israel. Uh, we have seen that United States initiated diplomatic efforts with its Western allies to, uh, to halt um, uh, Iran to strike back and then to Israel to uh, attack Iran. Why you uh, and your allies didn't join any condemnations to stop Israel to further continue the, uh, the, 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 the escalation that will prolong this escalation? But you, you are being diplomatic. You are doing at best your level for the diplomatic measures, but not with the condemnation. So I, I will say that we don't, I don't agree with every one of the premises in that question, but we have very much uh, been engaged to try to prevent further escalation of the conflict. And with that, we'll wrap for today. Thanks, everyone.